over a couple of weeks, you're not going to have that kind of change. Maybe you have a magical unicorn puppy and maybe you're super, super consistent. And of course you are going to see progress, but over a couple of weeks of puppy class, you're not having a fully trained dog. Also hate to burst your bubble. You're not going to have a fully trained dog until they're a year, a year and a Welcome to another episode of Dog Sense. I am Kathy and I am hosting this with Sarah, who is in Colorado. How are you, Sarah? Hey guys, I'm doing awesome. And we also have another amazing trainer with us from the New Jersey team. Welcome, Lauren. Hi guys. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. It's so fun to have Lauren in the studio. We have to do this more often. Absolutely. I'm happy to come anytime. You All right. know, I'll be here. Our schedules are wild to get this to happen. This was tough. It was really tough. <laughs> and we were building. It's, it's crazy. All right. Yeah. So let's get to it. The top challenges that we see in puppy classes. Now, I'm just going to give you a little preview here. We're not talking about jumping and nipping, <laughs> breaking, right? We covered all those. Those are other podcasts. Grab them, listen to them, make notes. But here we wanted to talk about some challenges that you don't realize you're going to have until you're there and then it's too late. So we want to start with giving you some things to do before you actually get to class. So why don't we start? Let's set them up for success. Okay. All right. I think my biggest thing is when people come into classes, my first thing that I want to explain, or at least tell them to do is bring three different types of treats, Mm -hmm. right? You want a low value, a medium value and a high value. And then you say, well, what is that? I'm just one type of treat with my dog. Like, what do you mean? Low, medium, high. So low value, you know, they like it. Yeah. Eat it. Yeah. They like it. They get it all the time. They get it all the time. That's the thing. Low value in my brain is something that they get all the time. So Mm -hmm. they're kibble, right? Bring their meals. Um, Cheerios. I've had people use rice cake, you know, something bland, something, you know, nothing that they really, they like, but it's, you know, it's a, it's okay. Um, And then medium value would be like your training treats, right? You know, stuff that you get at the store, you know, at Petco wherever, and that you grab, for whatever. Right. Uh, and then high value is like the good stuff, right? <laughs> like chicken, cheese, hot dogs, roast beef, liverwurst, yeah. uh, whatever you got left over in the fridge. Uh, because, you know, you're going to come to class and there's a lot going on. There's other puppies, there's other people, you know, they're in a different environment. So if the environment level goes up, that treat value is going to have to go up. So you may be used to giving your dog, you know, crappy kibble all the time. And they're like, yeah, I'll eat it at home. Cause I live here. But now you're going out and you see Rover across the way who's got like chicken and they're like, oh, heck yeah, I want to go there and have that. So, yeah, it's like your kid at the lunch table. Yeah. You gave him like tuna fish and that kid over there has like Nutella. Yeah. And he's like, like, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. You want to trade? Yeah. (laughs) What about the dog who doesn't like food, Sarah? What are you doing with that? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, all right. So the other thing too, is then you can bring a variety of toys. If your dog is more toy motivated than they are food motivated, maybe your low level toy, it's kind of like the, you know, maybe it's like the soft fleecy toy that's kind of hanging out around the house all the time. Your dog loves to play with it, but it's not like next level. Maybe your medium value one is maybe that's like your moo tug or like your something like a special tug toy that you guys engage with together. Your high value toy is something like a squeaker, right? Or a ball and a string or that rabbit fur fleecy from clean run. That's like super, super high value, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, you can kind of gauge your level of toy. It could also be something like a Frisbee versus a ball, right? So some dogs go crazy over balls. Some dogs love Frisbees. You can change the, whatever type of toy your dog likes best. You can gauge the value of it the same way you do with food. Yep. And they shouldn't exist in the environment. Just like the high value treats never happen unless you're in training sessions. And that's what makes it so special because the dog says we get this when we work together. Yeah. And I think every dog is going to have a different value in their head, right? So some dogs like my, I have a little dog and she would eat anything. Anything could be high value to her. (laughs) Honestly, you could feed her rocks and she'd be happy. (laughs) You know, I could give her kibble as probably a high value. And my older dog is the total opposite. He'll like, yeah, I'll eat the kibble, but he really likes the chicken. Like that's his favorite. So every dog is going to be different. So you kind of have to just kind of gauge it and kind of see what you get. And sometimes yeah. it's the delivery of the reward. Mm-hmm. If I, I have it, Kathy reading my mind now. Yeah. All right, Sarah, you do <laughs> nice. this. <one. laughs> Fine, way to take my steam. Woo. All right, well, what I was going to say was also 
right? Like we mentioned, your dog decides what's valuable to them. If your dog loves physical, like, or verbal praise and physical affection, that's their highest value reward. You can use that in class as well, right? So we always call it our Mary Poppins dog training voice, right? That super high pitched, squealing, excited voice that your dogs go nuts for, but they might not hear that at home, but they hear it from us at Fast Track. They hear it from us in private lessons when they're boarding with us. They love it. So in class as well, you can also change the value of how excited you are and kind of how much praise you get, or maybe like that special scritch that your dog loves behind their ear. So like if you're, if your dog is the one that they don't care about toys, they don't care about food. Maybe it's a Sheba or something. I don't know. <laughs> one of those rare breeds that like doesn't care about anything. Um, maybe that's what you're using for them as yeah. your reward in class. Cause your dog decides what's most valuable to them. You just have to learn what that is and then leverage it. Now, speaking of Sheba's, I have a student <laughs> Who, and I went through this with her too. The dog was like, she'd hand her chicken or whatever. And the dog would be like, meh. But when I had her bowl it mm-hmm. on the floor, nice. the yeah. dog was like, oh, I chased that. Right. And I don't even think the dog really wanted the chicken. I think the dog <laughs> wanted the chase. And so I was like, oh, can we roll like kibble? Let's see. Yeah, yeah. So the delivery of the reward, maybe you standing there like a vending machine and shoving it in their mouth isn't really doing it for them. So yeah. maybe throwing it and having them run and move, get out of that static position is going to get them more excited. Yeah, it is the engagement and how you present yourself. And like Sarah said, the talking and, you know, throwing the cookie. And, you know, if you just stand there like, yes, good job. Yeah, this, they're going to be like, yeah, that's lame. Yeah, that's so boring. I yell at my students all the time. I don't yell. (laughs) You know, I'm like, it sounds like, you know, there's no one in the room. I'm like, there's all these people in here and and you're not talking to your dog, like engage with them. It's like, if we went on a hike and I was texting the whole time, you'd be like, oh, Lauren, I don't want to go on a hike with her anymore. Like engage with them. Let them know that you like what they're doing. Use your words. You're competing with the environment and everything in it. Now we all teach puppy classes. Give me your, give me each one really good tip for people who come in class and say, my dog can't focus. Like, I, I don't want to come to class because he's too distracted. How do we teach them to focus? Okay, I want to start with this one because <laughs> there's a couple more things I wanted to touch on before we got into class. Okay, so <laughs> before, all right, so here's my, so if someone came in and said that to me, I would then ask them what happened before class. Was your dog in their crate taking a nap so that when you got to class, they were lonely, hungry, and bored, right? They wanted to work for you. Also, did you skip a meal, right? If your dog just ate dinner, you're coming to a night class, they're not going to be super food motivated. They're, they already ate. They're good. They don't need you anymore. Right. So I would say, try to skip your meal or just do half a meal. If it's a, if it's a puppy or whatever, but try to skip your meal, try to make sure they're created before you walk in the door. And also just make sure you have your variety of treats. Like we talked about and make yeah. sure they're potty. Yes. <laughs> potty is what potty before you walk in that door. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and yeah. make sure they go to the bathroom before you come inside. And this could be a list like right here. We have this right off the tip of our tongue. Like we can roll this out in our sleep. We could tell you this, but you might need to write notes. And so go ahead and do that. I like the idea of a training bag. They get a little gym yes. duffel bag. Nice they throw stuff. their stuff in it. It's already packed. The only thing you have to do is if you have perishable treats, yep. grab the little pre-made Ziploc baggies, throw it in your bag and you're ready for class. Yeah. So much that. easier. Yeah. That should be another one. You should talk about what you put in your travel bag. <gasps> we should do that one, Sarah. But a lot. I'll add it to the list. Okay. So for this one, okay. I got a lamb. I got a car. (laughs) All right. So now we're at class and we're, we've done all these awesome things. We have a variety of treats. We created them before they got there and um, we made sure they didn't eat dinner, but we're still having a hard time focusing. Lauren, what would be, what would you tell your students to do in class? So, I mean, usually in the beginning of class, we try to do something to get the dog engaged and focused, right? Some kind of activity, something simple, some canine gym stuff, maybe fit pause, just something, impulse control games to get them their attention back on them. Um, big fan of body blocking, using your body physically to tell the dog to focus on you. But realistically, like Kathy said, you're trying to trump the environment. You're trying to tell the dog that you are the greatest thing since sliced bread around all these other dogs and people. So when your dog is calm and quiet, feed your dog, give them a cookie, right? You know, work on, you know, if you like the reinforcement, if you like what they're doing, feed it right? Yep. Give them something. So that way they at least know what they're supposed to be doing. Your puppy has no idea what they're supposed to be doing. You put them in a room with all these dogs and they're like, playtime, right? We just get to <laughs> run around and play. So if you, if you're there and you got your good treats and you're like, Hey, here's, you know, some happy Howie while you just sitting there and looking at me, the dog's gonna be like, Oh yeah, this, yep. is, this is great. Like I need to focus on you. Yeah. So, you are more important than the environment. You are way point. more important than the environment. Now I always tell my students, This is the only time when you shouldn't be looking at somebody who's talking to you. 
I want your eyes <laughs> on your puppy and I want you drip feeding. So you got a bunch of food in your hand and you're looking at the puppy and you're feeding. If I ever say to them, okay, look over here so I can do a demo. I ask them to put their foot on the leash, which we call stand on the dog, which they're not really standing on the dog. They stand on the leash, not the dog. Yes, just on the leash, <laughs> giving them like a little bit, a few inches of room so they can't lunge and play with the other puppies and jump on people. And then you can watch. And then it's like right back to your dog. Focus back on them because that's where the action is going to be. Yeah. And I think that even, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have a dog or like, even as a trainer, like I can stick a leash under the dog and I can still feed and have a conversation, but you know, it is something after a while, once you do it, like even when you're not in class, right? Like, let's say you go outside, you're with your dog and you're having a conversation with your neighbor, you know, you step on the leash and if you do it enough and you feed the dog enough, after a while, you're going to step on that leash and the dog's like, I'm here for a while. Let me just kind of settle down and lay down. Yeah. Right, because they have no choice but to go anywhere else. So they're like, okay, my mom's having a conversation, whatever she's doing, I'm going to get a bunch of treats. I'm just going to sit here and be calm and wait for her to be the vending machine and feed me all the goods. Yep. And this is a technique that they use for service dogs because when the person who has a handicap has sat down or stopped moving, we want the dog to relax, especially if it's going to be a long duration, like at a restaurant or something like that. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, the next one, Sarah, let's talk about managing people's expectations when they go to class and when they go through a couple of weeks, I think that their expectation is they're going to come for a few weeks and their dog is going to be, their puppy is going to be completely trained. They're going to fall in love with it. They're going to stop hating their life and rainbows, lollipops and roses are going to occur. We're here to tell you right now, that's just not going to happen. Hate to burst your bubble. It's just, it's not going to happen. Over a couple of weeks, you're not going to have that kind of change. Maybe you have a magical unicorn puppy and maybe you're super, super consistent. And of course you are going to see progress, but over a couple of weeks of puppy class, you're not having a fully trained dog. Also hate to burst your bubble. You're not going to have a fully trained dog until they're a year, a year and a half, or even two years old, right? It takes time, consistency. There's also so many different life stages that your puppy is going through during that first year of their lives that affects your training so much. Yeah. Eight months sucks. Awesome. <laughs> um, Adolescence. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Even my dog went through it. I'm like, do you know who yeah. I am? I'm Kathy. Like, don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Over there to the river. I'm like, no. But I also yeah. think that if you relate it back to your human experience, do you go to the gym six times and look amazing? Right. Do you go to college for six weeks and are fluent in French? Like, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, even when you're little, you go kindergarten through 12 yep. and you college, like, so yeah, yeah, you can get through those basics in your, you know, 12 years or whatever, but then you get your, you know, even after that, like Sarah said, you know, two years, but you know, you don't just stop training your dog. It's not right. really how it works. And it's not like as intense as puppies, so don't get me wrong, no, no. but you still want to sprinkle in some stuff here and there to keep their brains kind of going. Um, but it's not something that's just going to poof and magically just happen. It's consistency. Mm -hmm. and making sure that everybody in the house is on the same page and everyone's doing the same stuff. And like Sarah says, the age appropriate. What we're teaching in puppy class isn't what we're teaching in beginner or advanced or off-leash classes. It's just not because they're not ready for it. And in addition, we're training you. So we are training two species (laughs) and canine. And you both have to get your act together. And when you do, and then you start working together, that's when it all comes together. But, you know, you're kind of like faking it till you make it. Yeah. And one of the biggest things we also talk about with students too is remember you're put the time in now, right? Put the time in, put the effort in while they're a puppy, because you hopefully have another 10, 15 years with this dog where they're going to be the most amazing companion for you. But while they're a puppy, that's where we have to be super on them, super consistent, making sure that they're not picking up on any of those bad habits or bad life skills that are then going to carry on and continue to drive you nuts as a dog then gets over a year, two years, three years, four years old. And yeah. you don't know this stuff. So we're educating you. And I think that not our students, because we do a lot of education, but other people find that they have puppy classes and then those people drop off because the puppies rock the puppy class. Yeah. And then in two or three months, they're going to come back. And all that time that they could have been training, they lost that ground. And so yeah. now they have to pick it up when the dog is in the, oh yeah, make me mode. Right. <laughs> No fun. Yeah, that is definitely the worst. So yeah, as long as you, you know, stick with it, keep up the classes, bump up the level, go to that puppy too. Cause puppy class, you're, you're learning the basics, right? You're getting the sit, the down, the, you know, and all that's great. 
on the training floor, but the yeah, idea yeah. is to teach your dog how to do this in a real life situation. Mm -hmm. I can't go from, you know, training my dog with zero distractions to then having my dog maybe come to me when they're loose in the yard, right? Like yeah. it's just not going to happen. So you need those little steps to build up to those points where all this training is used as part of to really make your life better and to keep the dog safe. Now, yeah, yeah. after we've said all that, we do have to talk about optimism. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going to have bad days. Probably you're going to listen to this and go home and be like, oh my God. But we want you to understand that your puppy will get trained. Your dog yes. will get trained. It's it's going to happen. And you can help the process by staying optimistic and, and not labeling your puppy. Like how many puppies, people come to your class and they're like, oh, my dog is so reactive or fearful or pulley or... And we'd rather you say, my dog is working on not jumping. My dog is working okay. on not being fearful because that frames it differently because you almost bring your puppy up to what you're saying he is. You almost sort of keep raising it. The more you say things, the more you, what is it? You achieve them. Yeah. Sort of. you, you work through that. And we don't want that to happen. So feel better about where you are and know that it's going to get better and it's going to get worse. It's going to get better. Like you're going to go through it, but you're going to get to the end. You will. And yeah. also know that when you come to puppy class, it's a built-in support group. Everyone is going through this similar, probably the same things. And it's also good to remember, most likely what you're experiencing with your puppy is not out of the ordinary. A lot of times we'll get calls where we're like, oh my God, my puppy is aggressive. Like it is biting me everywhere. Like it's aggressive. And we're like, eh, from experience, this is normal for the breed of dog that you have chosen, right? So, and yeah, those types of dogs are really bitey and this is totally normal. And here's how we're gonna work through it. So we always have solutions for you guys. Um, I don't want to jinx us. There's not much that we haven't seen, or at least there's not much. That, I mean, Kathy probably has seen it all, right? But Lauren and I as well, we've probably seen whatever it is that you're going through and mm -hmm. we can help. We'll get you through it. And also by coming to puppy class, you can also see, hey, look, that puppy's biting the heck out of their owner's pants as well. I guess it wasn't that uncommon. Hey, how do we work on this? Right? So the puppy class can also provide a really great support group for you too. Now, because I want to make this a seven hour episode, I think it's important to jump in and just talk about classes you might take on Zoom. Like, how do you set that up for success? And my quick tip would be make sure you're in a room without distractions. You, you've set your camera up. The instructor can see you. You have all the things that you need. You potty your puppy and you come into the room and then you're ready to go. I'd also put a sign on the door saying puppy class in progress. Yeah. Do not bother me. If the house is not on fire, I do not want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I think the biggest thing, like I love what Sarah touched up on is that, you know, everybody is going through the same things. It's like when you go to college and you're a freshman and you're like, Oh, I don't know. But like everyone's in the same boat as you, yeah. everyone has a puppy. And if your puppy is the youngest, right? The other people are going to be in class and be like, Oh yeah, I went through that. Or if your dog is the oldest or in the middle, you have those other people who, you know, where you can kind of help them out and kind of bounce ideas back. And, but my biggest thing is don't be afraid to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid because either you have the question and you don't want to say it, or somebody else has that question. And you're like, Oh man, like, yeah, I should have thought of that. Or maybe it didn't happen yet. And you can think of when that does happen. Oh, I remember Jerry said something in class last week about that. And, Oh, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And so it is, it is kind of nice to have that support system and kind of ask those questions. And that's what I like about classes. You see what may happen to your puppy even before it happens. Like, and damn, I don't want that. <laughs> right? Like, I hope I never have that. Oh, and, and also you go to puppy class and you're like, I thought my puppy was terrible. Yeah. Oh Ooh. my God. Look at that puppy. And nice. then you go home and you tell the stories, but it's just, it's a great sense of community. And that's what we yeah. built in our school. We love our students. They're our family and they become family to each other. And we all support each other because it really is a journey. And we're all on this with you together. Yep, absolutely. All right, guys, Lauren, thank you for joining us. Hopefully we'll get you on for about, for what, maybe one more episode. We can do one more topic with you as well. Um, all right, guys. So as always, if you like what you hear, jump over to whichever su subscription service you downloaded from. Like, rate, subscribe, tell a friend, share this episode if you know someone who just got a new puppy and is maybe nervous about going to a puppy class. Um, so we can help spread the word and we can continue to create an awesome community of dog lovers and learners. All right, guys. Hopefully we'll see you at puppy class. Bye. Bye, guys.